Good evening. I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, during a sexual misconduct crisis in Canada's military, another hit. The military's head of personnel off the job because of a CBC News exclusive. I just froze. My body just froze. I, I didn't know what to do. Tonight, the allegations and the investigation as another member of the armed forces leadership is accused of sexual assault. We were sort of told that, well, this is the man's world. Suck it up. CBC News has also learned disturbing new details about deaths in an Ontario COVID ward after a doctor was charged with first degree murder. Police are now investigating at least five sudden deaths in COVID patients. Plus, incredible relief in Ontario. You can't describe the, the smiles. After a toddler missing since Sunday is found alive and well. And have you been having COVID dreams? People dreamed about swarms of bees and hornets flying at them, armies of cockroaches. If the pandemic is invading your brain overnight, you are not alone. This is The National. Well, tonight we have new allegations and new disturbing details on two major stories in this country, both of them revolving around people in positions of trust who are now under investigation. One, a doctor charged with murder, the other, a military leader. And we'll start there in the Canadian Armed Forces, where tonight, as two former chiefs of the defense staff are investigated for alleged sexual misconduct, a third high-ranking official is now off the job indefinitely facing even more serious allegations. Vice Admiral Admiral Hayden Edmondson was in charge of the military's human resources. He's now on leave after CBC News told the Department of National Defense we were about to release this story. It is an exclusive interview with a former member of the military who alleges Edmondson raped her on board a Navy ship in 1991. Edmondson denies the allegations. Ashley Burke takes us through them. And a warning, they are told in detail. You know, I feel sad seeing this. Stephanie uh, Vio was 19 at the time. Uh, this is me. A steward new to the Navy, serving on HMCS provider in 1991. So that's the uh, combat department. So Back then, Hayden Edmondson was the third highest ranking officer on the ship. Vio says that November, Edmondson sexually assaulted her, but she says she was too afraid to report it. I figured I would be strong enough to move on, but I know now 30 years afterwards that it never, it never leaves you. Vio says the inappropriate behavior escalated during an exercise at sea, one of her duties to wake up officers, including Edmondson, for their night shifts. He started showing uh, parts of his body and it progressed over time and it lasted, you know, many nights. The last time that he's done that, uh, I went to wake him up and he was on his back uh, completely naked and he was waiting for me. I yelled, I can't take this any longer. Vio says when the ship docked in Hawaii, Edmondson asked to speak to her in his cabin. Vio says she was expecting an apology. He wouldn't let me go. I can't say that it was a, a violent situation, but he sort of pushed me to the, to the, um, to the wall. And uh, he started undressing me, and uh, he removed all my clothes. And then he turned me around and he raped me. There's no other way to say it. Another person on board who asked to conceal her identity confirmed to CBC News that Vio went missing at the time of the alleged assault. But I do remember going back to look for her and I remember calling her name. I went to respond back to her calling and he just put his hand on my mouth and he's, he said, I just froze. My body just froze. I, I didn't know what to do. I was terrified. Vio says fears about career reprisals kept her silent. The culture was accepting this behavior. We were sort of told that, well, this is the man's world. This is, our, this is how it is. Suck it up. Vio later left the military. She says she's telling her story now in an effort to heal and is calling for an independent investigation into the vice admiral. I want justice for me, but I also want justice for others. 
So, Ashley, what is Edmondson's response to these allegations? Adrian, Vice Admiral Edmondson denies the allegations. In a statement sent to CBC News, he said, I categorically deny that I have ever had non-consensual sex with anyone ever. He also said he was not provided sufficient details of the allegations or time to respond in detail. CBC News did provide Edmondson with an extensive list of claims yesterday. He's on leave with pay indefinitely, and the Department of National Defense says the military is troubled by the allegations. The case has been referred to military police. All right, Ashley Burke in Ottawa tonight. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Well, CBC News has learned shocking new details about a murder investigation centered on a Hawkesbury, Ontario hospital. Dr. Brian Nadler is accused of killing a patient who had COVID-19. Now, as Amanda Pfeffer explains, the investigation is expanding as police examine as many as five more COVID deaths. The hospital in Hawkesbury, Ontario, was hit hard with a COVID outbreak mid-March. By March 25th, it reported five people had died in one week, the most in several months. The same day, Dr. Brian Nadler, one of its physicians, was taken away in handcuffs and charged with first-degree murder. Now CBC News has learned that investigation is looking at at least five deaths of COVID-19 patients and the medication used to treat them. That'll be part of the ongoing investigation. We Bill Dixon with the Ontario Provincial Police says forensic autopsies begin this week. There were grounds there for investigators to think we need to look deeper and take a, a, another look at cause of deaths just to make sure. The charge of first-degree murder was laid in the death of 89-year-old Albert Poitinger. He lived at a Montreal senior's residence about 30 minutes away. I'm pretty shocked to hear that. Liam Morrell works at the residence and knew Poitinger. Very nice guy. Uh, him and his wife, Inge, uh, lived here. And uh, yeah, no, he was just a super nice guy, always very pleasant. Nadler's lawyer says his client maintains his innocence. Welcome to Hawkesbury and District General Hospital. Now the hospital is trying to restore trust. When you call, the hospital message begins with an acknowledgement that a lot of people are looking for answers. Important message. If you are concerned about care you or a family member received at HGH. Tonight, CBC News has learned that Brian Nadler was under a one-year restricted license until February 3rd. It means that he was under the supervision of another doctor during that period. The College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario won't give any details about that restriction. Earlier today, Brian Nadler's license to practice medicine was suspended. Amanda Pfeffer, CBC News. Ottawa. Late breaking tonight, CBC News has learned of new strict province-wide measures coming to Ontario to beat back COVID-19. And here's why. The variants are ahead by a mile. The variants of concern are taking over. Province-wide, our situation appears grave. So Ontario is now dealing with coronavirus 2.0. Not only have daily new cases doubled over the past month, but as of last week, the percentage of those cases caused by virus variants had rapidly soared to 60%. By now, it may be even higher. With virus growth this explosive and hospitals already this stressed, we have learned just tonight that the Ontario Premier is preparing to slam on the brakes. Four weeks province-wide to be announced tomorrow. Katie Nicholson has the details of what's coming and what it means for people, including those on the front lines. The moment ICU nurse Birgit Umaigba woke up today, she knew she couldn't go in. I had to take this day off because I am exhausted. Now we're starting to see um, two patients to one nurse, even three patients sometimes, so it's really getting scary. Over the course of the pandemic, Ontario's ICUs have never had as many COVID patients as they do right now. And doctors are bracing for it to get much worse. A real possibility that in a few weeks from now, we're going to be in a situation where we don't have ICU beds. And that is Again. sort of the, the scariest situation that we can envision. That scary situation has now prompted an emergency break Effective Saturday, the whole province will enter a month-long lockdown. Restaurants will close for on-site dining once again. No more patios for now. Same goes for hair and nail salons and gyms. And for parents whose children have spent the pandemic ping-ponging between openings and closures, now worry that schools will close too. 
something some schools in Toronto have already been hinting at. We like consistency. We, we don't like going back and forth again and again. But for healthcare workers, this is a dream come true. We take one step forward and we take so many steps backwards. So, yeah, the, there should be a province-wide lockdown as of right now. And on Saturday, this exhausted ICU nurse will finally get what she's been waiting for. Okay, so Katie, we now have a sense of what is closed, but what, what's going to be open over the next month? Right, so your essential retail, that is going to be remaining open at 50% capacity. That's your grocery stores, your drug stores, um, and other retail will remain open at 25% capacity. If you like to golf, good news for you, you continue doing that. Uh, religious services will be able to continue with limited capacities. We also know uh, that construction that business is not going to slow down. That will continue, Adrian. Okay, Katie Nicholson, thank you. You're welcome. And let's turn now to infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Suman Chakrabarty. So uh, fitness and personal care closed, retail open, reduced capacity, you just heard it, schools potentially still a go. Does all of this go the distance? You know, I, I think that it's certainly going to uh, decrease the numbers, but what I didn't hear anything of yet is anything about essential workers. And I think this is where the bulk of our infections are coming from, them and also in their households. So I really hope to have some type of intervention to help the cases in terms of the growth from that area of the population. Because let's, let's underline your, your bottom line here. The, the consequence of not going far enough is what? Listen, uh, the, the growth that we're at right now will overwhelm the ICU, overwhelm hospitals' ability to look after critical patients. This is something we really want to avoid, and especially having to pull back on things like essential surgeries. You know, So this is something that we really don't want to get to. Hopefully things do improve, and at least partially addressing the, the drivers of this transmission will definitely help with that. In your mind, schools, a key driver of that transmission? Schools, I, I want to keep open for as long as I can. At some point, you have to close them if things get uh, really bad. But they're not certainly a strong driver of transmission, as you see with other areas. Like I said, with things like factories, food processing plants, they're at a high uh, concentration here, especially in my region in Peel. Very good to get your insights. Dr. Suman Chakrabarty, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Take care. Now, today, Quebec's government hit the brakes as well. The premier announced school closures and a new curfew in some hotspots. Until recently, Quebec was optimistic about where it was in the pandemic. But as Alison Northcott shows us, a lot can change in a week. For some parts of the province, the situation is critical and the Premier says it's getting worse. In the coming days, hospitalization will increase. We must act quickly. In the areas he's most worried about, Quebec City, Lévis and Gatineau, an emergency intervention. For 10 days, schools will shut down, non-essential businesses will close and there will be an earlier 8 p.m. curfew. We're feeling very, uh, I, I guess, shocked and disappointed. Caroline Paquette is a business owner and mother of three. It's just been um, a crazy roller coaster, and to be back here again today, where everything is closing, where the announcements are last minute, uh, where the kids are back at home, which is extremely difficult. The impact again is the risk of losing employees, the changing sector, and the other impact is that the uh, the sales will be uh, will go down again. I mean, uh, it's takeout and delivery is not enough to keep the. Uh, uh, the restaurants alive. Just last week, Legault seemed optimistic. We're resisting against the variants and the third wave. And now? It's a wake-up call. The, ser the situation is very serious. In the Quebec City region, over 10 days, daily new cases jumped from 35 to nearly 200. Health officials shut down this gym. The 68 cases now linked to it clearly frustrating Quebec City's mayor. Bravo, champion. Tout le monde a des beaux biceps. Everyone has nice biceps, he says, but everyone is sick. And a few weeks ago, we were all under this false sense of security. Now, you know, this infectious and diseases and physician says variants are making things even harder to control. Potentially even something you did before, such so as having dinner and maybe just, you know, sitting across from the table saying, oh, it wasn't so risky before, has become more risky. In some areas, like Montreal, the premier says things are under control, but he warns that could change quickly. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. British Columbia today recorded 1,013 new COVID cases. That is its highest single day total ever. And it's not a blip. Average daily case rates are up 30% in just the past week. As that surge sinks in, the owner of a restaurant in Kelowna, B.C., 
is apologizing for a large party held there earlier this week. The owner of Charlie Victoria, a restaurant in Kelowna's popular Big White Resort, said holding the party was an ignorant decision made out of pure selfish frustration over restrictions announced in B.C. that same day. This after outraged reactions to these images. <laughs> The packed, maskless, shouting crowd, a portrait of a potential super spreading event that has today led the Big White Resort to terminate the restaurant's lease. The restaurant also announced it is closing for the season. Sorry, the resort also announced it's closing for the season six days earlier than scheduled, citing safety concerns. Well, human error has led to the loss of roughly 15 million doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The New York Times reports that workers at a Baltimore plant got the formula wrong. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration is investigating. Now, while the mishap will delay delivery of new vials, officials in the U.S. still expect to have enough vaccine for every adult American by the end of May. Though, as far as Canada is concerned, it's not clear just yet what this means for deliveries here. Now, some good news on the pandemic front tonight. Millions of parents are welcoming an announcement by Pfizer today about how well the vaccine works in children between the ages of 12 and 15. Christine Burak explains the hope and the potential timeline. They might not get as sick as adults, but children are getting infected and spreading this virus. They also make up roughly 20% of Canada's population. I think it's almost impossible um, to reach herd immunity without vaccinating children. That's one reason why Pfizer's latest trial is key. The data isn't peer-reviewed yet, but in a press release, Pfizer announced its COVID-19 vaccine is safe and demonstrated 100% efficacy in preventing the disease in teens aged 12 to 15. Experts say safety is key, but the effectiveness remains to be seen. I think what we need to remember here is trials, clinical trials, only measure what you see in a clinical trial. They don't look at the big real world. Pfizer's trial included over 2,200 adolescents in the U.S. Half got the vaccine, the others a placebo shot. The company says 18 cases of COVID-19 were reported among those who got the placebo, compared with none in the vaccine group, and there were no major side effects. Experts are still waiting to see all the data, but insist. This is enormously encouraging positive results. I've been waiting for this news, right? The Wellmans say a safe and effective vaccine for their kids can't come fast enough. The socialization, being able to hang out with their friends, like they're really missing that. Her question is, could Health Canada approve Pfizer's shots for 12 to 15 year olds before the start of the next school year? We haven't seen the data yet. We'll be getting that in a couple of weeks at Health Canada for review. If all goes well, experts hope a vaccine could be ready for younger teens by September. At the same time, Moderna is conducting a Canadian clinical trial for kids aged 5 to 11 years old. Those results are expected early next year, which could put herd immunity well within reach. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. The governments of Canada and Ontario are teaming up with pharmaceutical company Sanofi to boost Canada's ability to produce vaccines at home. The three parties are committing a total of $925 million for a new vaccine facility. So it will go up at the current Sanofi site in Toronto. And while this will not help in this pandemic, the federal government says in a future flu pandemic, it will be able to produce enough vaccine for the entire country in six months. It is expected to be finished by 2027. Now, where there could have been tragedy, there is instead immense relief tonight for an Ontario family reunited with their three-year-old son. He had been alone, lost in the woods for days. Nicole Williams brings us the story of the desperate search and the incredible moment police found the little boy alive. The moment so many hoped for, three-year-old Jude Layton being carried out by officers after being lost since Sunday and finally reunited with a family anxiously waiting. Found him by his blue, odd-colored blue coat in the woods. And uh, when they approached him, he was, had his eyes closed. And uh, when they got close enough, his eyes popped open. And uh, that's a, what a great feeling. 
Police say they were able to walk him out after giving him a sip of water. A good sign for a little boy lost in the woods for that long. You can't describe the, the smiles and the, the, just the overwhelming joy that they've uh, they now experienced being reunited. You could feel the relief here this evening. Over the last few days, 50 Ontario provincial police officers and dozens of volunteers turned out to help with the desperate search. Police officers found him a kilometre east of his family's fishing retreat. That's where Leighton was last seen Sunday morning before wandering off. For the last three days, crews on foot and ATVs have been combing the area. Helicopters and dive teams also helped, but it wasn't easy. It's a densely wooded area surrounded by lakes and made worse by rain today. Since he went missing, the temperatures have ranged from 16 degrees to minus 2. He was in uh, good condition. I mean, he was responsive, alert to the officers. Layton was looked at by paramedics and taken to Kingston General Hospital for a more thorough assessment. Police say when he's ready, they'll talk to the boy to find out how he got lost. But tonight, his family and his community will rest a lot easier. Nicole Williams, CBC News, South Frontenac, Ontario. Well, emotional testimony from a witness at Derek Chauvin's murder trial today forced the court to take a recess. Oh my God. Up next, what he told George Floyd before he was killed. Plus, are you having weird COVID dreams? Turns out you are not alone. It's always me being in an overcrowded area with people that are neither practicing social distancing. How the pandemic is playing with our subconscious. And later, Canada's top doctors turn to social media influencers for help. Do you plan to post a picture of yourself getting a vaccine? Absolutely. I live tweeted my birth. I think I can do this. <laughs> the latest strategy to fight vaccine hesitancy. We're back in two. U.S. President Joe Biden unveiled a $2 trillion plan today to rebuild America's aging infrastructure and try to give a boost to the economy at the same time. It's not a plan that tinkers around the edges. It's a once-in-a-generation investment. The plan takes on everything from rebuilding roads and bridges to investing in transportation, housing, and the electric grid and aims to create millions of jobs in the process all over the next eight years. In Minneapolis, the trial of former police officer Derek Chauvin continued today with more chilling video, more wrenching testimony. And as Susan Ormerson shows us, a common theme from eyewitnesses, feelings of helplessness and guilt about watching George Floyd die. <laughs> oh my God. Witness Charles McMillian, overcome, watching police body cam video of Floyd's arrest, hearing his pleas. Can you just explain sort of what you're feeling in this moment? I can I feel helpless. McMillian was on the scene the whole time last May. Earlier, he testified he was urging Floyd to cooperate with police. I would tell him, Mr. Floyd, Ms. Blood, just apply with them, get on in the car because you can't win. Also today, new video not public before showing George Floyd inside Cop Foods where he went to buy cigarettes. Cashier Christopher Martin talked to him. Asked him if he played uh, baseball. Uh, he went on to respond to that, but it kind of took him a little long to get to what he was trying to say. So it would appear that he was high. Floyd fumbled in his pockets for bills and paid for cigarettes with an alleged fake 20. The store manager sent the cashier out twice to try to get Floyd and a friend back in the store. He was just kind of shaking his head and putting his hands in the air, like kind of like, why is this happening to me? Like, I don't want this to happen, sort of thing. When that failed, Cup Foods called in police. Later, seeing Floyd pinned to the ground by police, Martin testified how he felt. Uh, disbelief and guilt. Okay. Why guilt? Um, if I would have just not taken the bill, this could have been avoided. 
Outside Cup Foods is now a shrine, George Floyd Square, filled with mementos, murals, and painful memories relived this week inside that court. The jury will see the tape. It will be as obvious to them as it was to the eyes of the world. Marsha Howard, one of the activists here since last May, says people are relieved the trial has finally begun. There's a cautious hope, but it's America, and we know that power seeds nothing willingly. So the status quo will try very hard to maintain itself. So Susan, where is the prosecution going next with this case? Yeah, well, all this video, multiple hours, the juries on day three have already seen, you know, body cams, surveillance, bystander videos, prosecutors wanting to get it on the record early before the controversial evidence to come about medical evidence, how George Floyd died. So very clearly, we, you know, we've seen the emotion in the witnesses, but, but clearly the jury has to be feeling it too, right? Indeed, one jury signaled to the judge suddenly this morning saying she felt ill and said she hadn't been sleeping very well at all. The judge asked her stress related and she said, yes, already, Adrian. All right, senior correspondent Susan Ormiston in Minneapolis tonight. Thank you, Susan. In New York, an arrest has been made in a brutal assault against an Asian American woman, one of many across the U.S. during the coronavirus pandemic. And as Ellen Morrow reports, one of the most disturbing details of the attack was that nobody stopped to help. Imagine just walking down the street, then this. An Asian woman, 65 years old, kicked to the ground, stomped by a man, allegedly shouting, you don't belong here. No one helps the woman. Instead, this man closes the door. How does a woman get punched and stomped on in front of a luxury building and the doorman closes the door? Isn't that the perfect symbolism of exactly what is happening right now? The suspect arrested today charged with a hate crime. We will never accept or tolerate hate or violence of any kind in our great city. Another attack at an already painful time for the Asian American community. Our people are getting killed for no reason. The shootings in Atlanta killing eight people, six of them Asian women at Asian owned businesses. A 75 year old grandmother punched in San Francisco all in the last month. Anti-Asian hate crimes up 150% across major U.S. cities over the past year, fueled by the pandemic, exacerbated, advocates say, by Donald Trump's rhetoric. How have you been feeling these past few weeks? Sad and angry and fearful. Those feelings made worse, Tiffany Chang says, by this inaction. Her organization has partnered to create free online training for how bystanders can respond. That's what is needed most of all, is just that kindness and that willingness to be that stranger, to be that person who intervenes, to not be that person who closes the door on somebody in need. In response to the attacks, the Biden administration announced plans this week to better address anti-Asian racism, including tasking the Justice Department with doing more to investigate hate crimes against the Asian American community. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. And when we come back, why public health is turning to social media influencers. Your support as trusted voices in your community um, to take a lead in championing the uptake of vaccines. A new pandemic partnership. How effective will it be? And later, turning pieces of medical plastic into pieces of art. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Throughout the pandemic, medical experts have been fighting on two fronts, against the actual virus and against misinformation about it. Well, new research from the Ontario Medical Association narrows in on who is spreading myths about COVID-19. Turns out, Ontarians between the ages 55 and 64 are the most engaged in spreading misinformation online. The association says it's not clear why this age group is most active, but that it is concerning. So, obviously, social media can be used to spread false information, but there's hope it can also play a role in disseminating real facts about COVID-19. 
Ioana Romiliotis now with a look at how public health officials are teaming up with online influencers, hoping their message of truth goes viral. Message me, let me know. As a hip urban mom with thousands of followers, Yashi Murphy usually posts about raising condo kids, not boosting vaccine confidence, but she's going there. It's a COVID-19 vaccine. I'm just a bit of a sponge right now because I am not a medical professional. Uh, so if we can get some information about the science behind it and also what we can do as ambassadors, uh, that would be helpful. Murphy is one of nearly 40 social media personalities invited to a private Facebook event. We're here, uh, Dr. New and I and, and my other colleagues. To hear from top public health officials about how they can help promote COVID vaccines to their followers. Your support as trusted voices in your community um, to take a lead in championing the uptake of vaccines. The event is strategic. Many people who are vaccine hesitant tend to get their information on social media, including racialized communities who are among those more reluctant to roll up their sleeves. A lot of misinformation has been traveling uh, through social media. So I think Dr. Anya really Norom is working with other community leaders to raise vaccine awareness in the black community. Let's take a moment and observe what's going on. As a panelist in the event, she says social media influencers can also help break down skepticism. Yes, so where there's already an issue of, of, of trust, right? So I am excited that now they'll be engaging ways of providing, um, you know, factual information and then leaving, that leaving it up to people to make their own uh, decisions. But while the potential for good information on social media is undeniable, experts say companies like Facebook need to do more. Whether it's sincere or whether it's PR, um, it's probably a good thing that it happens, but it's ultimately superficial. Professor Taylor Owen says the core issue is how social media companies track impressions and promote content, including misinformation, and says in the middle of a public health crisis, pressure to regulate them is only growing. And when you have mis and disinformation running rampant on these platforms, confirming people's hesitancies about the vaccine itself, that is a real public health challenge. And I think the companies know that. And they know that governments and publics are going to start demanding they do more. And this is a sign of that. I think harmful COVID misinformation is bad uh, for business. It's bad for people. And we don't want it on our site. Kevin Chan is the head of public policy in Canada for Facebook. The strategy, he says, has been to remove harmful misinformation while directing people to trusted sources. We're not here to censor Canadians. The best way uh, to combat um, uh, concerns that are not founded by fact is to give people more information, to give them more context, and that's really what we're doing. What I am hoping as a woman of color, as a South Asian, is being able to connect with certain communities. As for Murphy, she's all for getting vaccinated and hopes her followers, most of whom are South Asian, will follow her lead. They've seen everything. They've seen me go from one kid to two. Uh, they've seen, you know, go through the meltdowns every single day. So there, there is obviously trust and I might share about excitement such as a vaccine, but then the truth will be when I actually get it and how I react to it too. Do you plan to post a picture of yourself getting a vaccine? Absolutely. <laughs> I live tweeted my birth. I think I can do this. <laughs> Send me messages if you have any questions. And like yeah. other influencers out there, she knows the power of sharing. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Up next, have you been having crazy pandemic dreams? Have you? <laughs> we set out to find out why. There's a connection between the types and vividness of the dreams we're having and, and what time we're staying in bed until. We ask the experts about something we are all experiencing. Welcome back. So it is not news that the pandemic has been horrible for our sleep, but exactly what it has done to us has become a huge source of intrigue for psychologists and sleep scientists around the world. And tonight, we are exploring the way the changes in how we sleep now are affecting how we dream and why. For all the talking we've done about the absurdity of our pandemic days, maybe it's the nights that have been the strangest. The anxiety keeping us staring at the ceiling, tossing and turning deep into the night and drifting into the weirdest of dream worlds. 
I dreamt that I was watching a movie and turned around to see my girlfriend had duct taped herself to my bedroom window. Canadian filmmakers have been illustrating the COVID dreams people submit. Academics chronicling them in global studies over the last year. Some of you sending us your bizarre tales. I, in my dream, I was like, oh my God, what? what? It's always and me being in an overcrowded area with people that are neither practicing social distancing or wearing this. a mask. I, I do not like COVID in my washroom. dreams. If the I could sanitize my washroom is mind. filthy. Um, the doors are hanging off the hinges. People and this waitress leans into me and says, I'm sorry, I have to do this. And then at the moment when she plunged, I screamed and woke up. Clearly, pandemic dreaming is by now a global phenomenon. And among the explanations for it is a pretty simple one. With so many no longer commuting, something happens around the time we used to get up for work. Many just don't. People around the world staying in bed almost an hour longer in the mornings, according to a Brown University survey. And for sleep scientists, there is meaning there. Is that, a, is that a thing, Elisabetta, that there's a connection between the types and vividness of the dreams we're having and, and what time we're staying in bed until? Yes, yes, definitely. So, so most vivid, immersive, kind of spatiotemporal, emotional dreams happen in the morning. And because morning dreams are more easily remembered, we're all talking about them. In a year that Elizaveta Solomonova of McGill has been collecting the stories of pandemic dreams, she's seen a shift. In those first days of lockdown, when no one was going anywhere and we felt stuck, we worked through that in our sleep. So the most prevalent dream theme during the first lockdown was trying over and over to do something and not succeeding. What they dreamt about, they dreamt about being unable to do stuff they wanted to do. Those feelings of trying to catch a flight and missing it, making a run for the border but not getting there, those dreams happened a lot. Harvard Medical School's professor Deirdre Barrett has been studying dream life her entire career. She says this era is a standout. Dream recall was just way up this time in a way that's, that was not as true of any other crisis. Imagery in dreams is sometimes really obvious. Consider what she found after 9-11. After looking at all that in real life, of course there were dream submissions of plane crashes or fires. But in the early days of the pandemic, COVID and the fear of it didn't necessarily look like anything. So our brains figured it out. Plenty of dreams of natural disasters, especially tsunamis and oddly bugs. And it could be any kind of insect. People dreamed about swarms of bees and hornets flying at them, armies of cockroaches running at the dreamer. Think about it, she says. Bugs are a pretty logical metaphor for viruses, and early pandemic dreams were infested with them. They certainly were for Mary Boutillier of Toronto, who sent us a deeply creepy COVID dream. I came in the house, took off my mask, and the inside of my mouth was coated with sticky, dead house flies and her mouth is full of like house flies and she's she's trying to get them out and there's like one mm -hmm. or two still left yeah that 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 would be in there are there anything from the bugs are going to kill you to just the bugs are are dirty and disgusting and it's more like this is going to make you sick once masks became the ubiquitous image of the pandemic they took over in dream imagery so have you been having any covid dreams Yes. Are you? Trust yeah. Margaret Atwood to be ahead of the curve on that one. Which I was at this big party, which I, in fact, had thrown. And in the middle of it, I realized it's a big party and none of us have got any masks on. Canadians who sent us their dream stories, like Rosie Grant of Edmonton, can apparently relate. You know those dreams where you show up somewhere like work or school and you're not wearing any clothes and it's rather embarrassing? Well, now the embarrassment comes from showing up somewhere without a mask. To be anxious in our sleep about a room full of unmasked people probably says a lot about how embedded the public health messages have become. And dreams of feeling trapped or locked away, which so many describe, are potentially important. And so what, what do you think people should, should do with this information? 
if you pay attention to some of the nuances of exactly what you're dreaming about and what it might be a metaphor for, some, some people aren't as conscious that the loneliness is even worse than the, the fear of getting the virus until they have this dream of being in solitary confinement. Having bad dreams doesn't mean it's bad for us. Uh, so very often our dreams are kind of revealing to us uh, our own existential concerns, our own fears, our own anxieties. More than a parlor game then to talk about the weirdness of our pandemic nights, all the drama in our brains that ramps up when the sun goes down. Wow. Okay, so, so now I'm curious. <laughs> have you been having pandemic dreams? Well, I have. I mean, I know you and I are both consider ourselves world champion sleepers <laughs> at the best of times, but I have been having a dream of trying to flee somewhere that is falling apart. It's like dirty, there's rubble everywhere, and I just can't get away from it. And I, you know, I th now I think that's that. <laughs> Yikes. Terrifying. <laughs> okay, uh, next, finding inspiration in the pieces of a pandemic. This is kind of the star of the show here lately. All the purple ones are all the Pfizer caps. An ICU nurse uses medical waste to create healing art right after the break. Welcome back. For most of us, the past year has been about making the most of a bad situation. And it's been even harder for frontline healthcare workers. But an ICU nurse in Saskatchewan has found a pretty unique way to cope, turning junk left behind by the pandemic into works of art. Here's Bonnie Allen. I'm a big recycler, so uh, I've been repurposing a lot of things. A lot of pieces of wood and pieces of plastic. Sean Tuvey doesn't like to waste anything. The 51-year-old registered nurse makes pieces of art from pieces of medical plastic. And it has everything that we use at, at work during the day to keep people safe and alive. And uh, there's antibiotics, there is sedatives, pieces of the ventilator. Tuvi works inside St. Paul's Hospital. He cares for COVID-19 patients in the intensive care unit. His co-workers help him collect clean plastic waste that has never touched a patient. We throw tons and tons of garbage out. Uh, I have thousands and thousands of pieces of plastic to work with and so many ideas. Sometimes I stay up at night thinking about ideas. So oh yeah, this is this is kind of the star of the show here lately. All the purple ones are all the Pfizer caps and then the yellow is the saline that they mix it with. Plastic caps from vaccine vials have become his finishing touch. There is the vaccine cap. Tuvi was inspired by these murals that hang inside Toronto hospitals and the nurses who made them years ago. Symbolically, it, to me, it represents all that care that, that not only I did, but the whole team did. Now, Tuvi's art is having an impact on his co-workers in the ICU. Looking at this piece, I was kind of very much stunned by this piece. And if we don't have a bright side, we could make one uh, out of that bad situation. It's also therapeutic for Tuvi. As a nurse, he's experienced burnout before. I was crying on my way to work. I was crying when I'd be out for a run, something wasn't right, and I had to take some time off, and so artwork, Physical exercise, some medication got me back on my feet again, and I'm doing really well these days. Making something beautiful out of trash. A mission with a message. I think it symbolizes hope. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Next on the national turkey trouble in an Ontario town. How this fearless turkey is running the roads and capturing hearts. Our moment is next. We'd like to introduce everyone to Tommy. Tommy is the turkey wreaking havoc in an Ontario town. And even though he does have a bit of a nasty streak, he has somehow won the hearts of his community. But still, he is causing a bit of trouble. And one man was able to capture his shenanigans all on camera. And tonight, it's our moment. I was out flying my drone and I could hear people honking out front of my house. So I flew my drone over the road and there's Tommy the turkey in the middle of the road and he's holding up the traffic. He's just not even moving, eh? Just like chilling. People were getting out and trying to get him off the road and he wasn't moving. And sometimes he gets aggressive, he'll come at you. It just depends on what kind of mood he's in that day. Tommy the turkey fears nothing. <laughs> 
people have become attached to him for uh, him being around for so long now. It's been going on for at least a year. There's been some jokes brought up saying that uh, Belver needs its own like Turkey 911. He's like running his own ride program out there. <laughs> Someone made a joke to me and said that there should be like t-shirts made saying like I got pecked by Tommy the turkey or something, you know. <laughs> okay, well, we'll see about the t-shirts, but <laughs> but jokes aside, even Rob concedes like there is a serious side to this too, right? And he he does really hope that the city gets involved because it could be dangerous with all those cars whizzing by. And he also wants to know why on earth this is happening. Uh, Rob has read online that some people think that Tommy is is looking at his own reflection in the cars and thinking, uh -huh. "Is that my mate?" which makes this a much sadder story than I an had anticipated, but... There you go. That is a national for March 31st. Good night. Good night.